Welcome to the Counseling Tutor Podcast, the must listen to podcast for students of counseling and psychotherapy. Here are your hosts, Rory Lees Oaks and Ken Kelly. Hi, I'm Rory, and with me, as always, is Ken. How are you, Ken? Exceptionally well in the United Kingdom at this moment. It is a midterm break, and that's uh, when we put on a special edition. So we don't put a number to the podcast. It's just a special edition, and generally in a special edition, what we'll do is we kind of turn to questions that we get asked a lot and try and answer those questions by bringing in an expert. Yeah, so we, uh, we contacted our good friends at the National Counselling Society, and I spoke to Chief Executive Officer Meg Nunn and put some questions to her. And how we put the questions to her was quite interesting. We we um, went into our Facebook page. And if you don't know where our Facebook page is, if you go into Facebook, type Counselling Tutoring, you'll find us. We're a closed group. And uh, why not come in and join us? And you'll be with thousands of like-minded people, um, tutors, students, qualified colleagues, um, supervisors, the whole caboodle of people in the world of counselling and psychotherapy come in. And uh, we asked our audience for questions and we forwarded them on to the National Counselling Society. And uh, Meg Nunn very, very kindly and comprehensively answered them. Yeah, and I think it's like when we, we, we look to a client, a client going into therapy has got a choice. They have a choice of what modality that they choose. They have a choice of which counsellor they choose. And we... As therapists, we have a choice too. We have a choice of professional body or ethical body. And there are a number. It doesn't matter where you are in the world. Chances are there are going to be a number of, of, of bodies that represent um, your your profession of counselling and psychotherapy. Uh, and I think that, uh, that a lot of questions have come in around the differences between different ethical bodies and I think that Meg really addresses the questions well in terms of who the National Counselling Society are, what they offer and how they work. So without any further ado, let's get straight into the interview. And it's my great pleasure to welcome Meg Nunn from the National Counselling Society. Meg, welcome. Hi Rory, thanks for having me. It's a total pleasure to be invited on. Yes, and um, I think it's um, it's an interesting point in time in terms of counselling, um, because there is a there's a number of ethical bodies of which the NCS is one. What, what's the history of the National Counselling Society? Where where are your roots or the society's roots? Yeah, that's an interesting one, and we've been talking about it quite a lot lately in the society. Um, so I've learned a lot myself recently. So we, I've, I've only been here six years, so a lot of it is before my time. We started like in the mid-90s as the Counseling and Psychotherapy Society. So that was about 95 to 96. Um, and then the Counseling and Psychotherapy Society then changed their name to the Counseling Society, which lots of our members will remember because we have quite a few members that have been around since then. And then finally, we became the National Counseling Society in around 2012 to 2013. Um, in terms of history, we... We kind of came to being from a group of counsellors, psychotherapists, hypnotherapists and psychologists who wanted an alternative to the other professional bodies that were out there at the time. We wanted to be more grassroots, to be more member-led, member-orientated. And we've grown and changed a lot, especially over the past few years. But the core principles behind why we were founded way back in the mid-90s have really stayed the same throughout our history. And I think it's important that when anyone new joins the society as a staff member, that they really get a feel for the importance of that, because I want it to be really evident. Um, you know, no matter who you talk to or no matter what you need the society for. Yeah, and I, I think that's a, that's an interesting history, a, a potted history. What, what makes you different from other ethical bodies? Where, where do you see your unique selling point, if if that's a, if that's a phrase we would use for, for an ethical body? Our USP. Yeah, um, that is a good question and one that we've kind of answered quite a lot over the, over the recent years. So I think the thing that stands out for me most personally is being member-led. Um, that's what we're all about. It's our MO, our raison d'etre. Um, that, that's what I feel draws people to us who ultimately want to have a say in policy, in direction, 
and it's it's really hard work don't get me wrong uh, we have a lot of passionate members who want input on in the different things that the society does and that can be quite hard to manage sometimes but it's wonderful our society is totally shaped by that and I'm really proud of it um so this week for example I had a great meeting with four of our members to discuss our communications guidance and how that can be improved and I came away from that meeting having not just a deeper understanding about what would make good communications guidance for members but actually what would be a really good way of presenting any guidance that we make that make you know make sure that it respects autonomy shows trust allows the client to make their own choices so yeah I think it was probably the most important meeting I've had this year I think in some ways I learned a lot from it from other people and I and I always do and I think that's the thing about being member orientated it's not just something we say you know we do it all the time I do it all the time um I'm oh, sorry <laughs> sorry back to the question um what can we offer that other ethical bodies can't um I think we can offer a lot of the same things so we've got a trusted register guidance support discounts um and all of the other ethical bodies offer their own things on top of that as well but I think I'm I'm happy to to say that being member-led is something the NCS is really really good at and uh, yeah, so I think that's my answer. Yeah, I think that's a very comprehensive answer. And I, I think what I've picked up there is member led. It sounds to me that, you know, as, as a CEO of an organization, you were really on the ground speaking to members, listening to them, and, yeah. and developing um, policy almost by, by, their, by their input. Um, is it important to have a mixed economy of ethical bodies? I, I think that it can be sometimes confusing for both professional colleagues and student colleagues to to know there's a number of ethical bodies is there a benefit to having a mixed economy of ethical bodies yeah absolutely um i mean i kind of i guess i have to say yes to that question anyway but honestly deep down the answer would definitely be yes so this profession is such a broad church um with as many ways of working as there are people almost so there couldn't really be a one-size-fits-all professional body. Unlike some professions where there's a right way and there's a wrong way to do things, that doesn't really exist here. We have perspectives, we have modalities, and we have our own personal politics, which also influences our choices. So I think if it weren't important, you wouldn't see such a number of bodies. We're not in a statutory, statutorily regulated field. I always stumble over that. Um, people can join all of the professional bodies or none if they don't want to. Um, but if they want to be part of an organisation that will represent them, their interests, it gives them guidance and support in the way that they need it, um, then there's choice out there for them. For some, that's one way of doing things. For others, it's another way that really benefits them. And perhaps also there's a spiritual element to what someone does, um, you know, or a specific modality that they want to work with. And that's, you know, that's how it works. And I think that's why... Um, personally, it's important. Yes, it's it, it seems it seems like the society has has kind of embraced a you know a pluralistic element to 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 each individual member, seeing yeah. seeing them as individuals, and you've you've kind of very clearly outlined all the aspects that could be you know from modality to spirituality mm-hmm. and and indeed you know personal politics. So when I graduated in 2002, my tutors talked about um, the profession being an emerging profession. It would seem now that we're grown up and part of that growing up process is that we're more accountable than we've ever been. And um, the National well, the Professional Standards Authority Accredited Register is now seen by employers as something essential for therapists to, to join via their ethical body. The NCS has done a lot of work on this. Yes, yeah, we have done a lot of work on that. Um, So when we were first admitted to the programme back in 2013, we were one of the first organisations to do so. And we found that um, it's really changed the landscape of the profession for us. It's meant that smaller organisations have a voice alongside other larger organisations, which means that members who were previously unable to find work we now have the opportunity to um, kind of work on their behalf with the support of the accredited registers program 
to make sure that they are able to get jobs in, for example, the NHS and the IAPT programme, um, through the Education Authority, through other government programmes and uh, kind of other smaller organisations that employ counsellors. So, yeah, it's really, it's really changed everything for us. So we're really very vocal in support of it. Um, and I, I think it's quite interesting. They're currently going through a strategic review, looking at the programme at the moment. So that could be really interesting in terms of the direction of the profession. And I would recommend that anyone who's interested in the accredited register programme keeps an eye out for the updates around that. Obviously, NCS members, we will update directly. Um, but the PSA are also updating people through their website. And I think that should be towards the end of this year, early next year, that something comes out about the changes that they're making there. Yes, and, and I think one of the things that employers look for now is that accredited registers um, program. You know, they ask, usually employers ask for a member of an ethical body. And, and part of that is it's, it's, it's kind of done through the ethical body, isn't it? People join the ethical body and then through either doing an online, an online test or through submitting work. What, what is the process for someone to be an accredited member uh, and to get on the register via your membership, via the NCS yes. membership? So for the register, uh, we look at training. So we mapped at off-call levels and we were one of the first organisations to do that. So we look for someone to have an off-call level for training in counselling and psychotherapy, uh, which has a placement of least, at least 100 supervised hours. Um, and that's what we look at for the register. Uh, and we, we go into a lot of depth when we assess the training that people have done. So we often ask for like course transcripts and things if we don't recognise the course already. And then we have different levels of membership after registration so we have what's known as accredited professional registration which is a work-based uh, uh, level which is equivalent to the BACP accredited membership so uh, it's the, the same standards as that basically uh, we look at we look for a written statement which is about seven and a half thousand words to go up to, to that level and you have to have been in practice for at least three years and have done you know, a minimum number of client hours. Um, so yeah, so so getting onto the register, obviously, yeah, we look at qualifications basically. Yes. So there's a there's a parity there with other ethical ethical bodies. What um, what does the NCS offer qualified practitioners? What what kind of things are do you get involved in to support practitioners who join you? Mm -hmm. Yeah, quite a few things. So the first thing, and I think the main thing, is being listed on our accredited register. So the same as you get with other professional bodies, as we were just talking about. It also functions as a very user-friendly directory, which we advertise on social media, so our members get clients to it. Um, and we've had some great success for members doing that. Uh, that's free. You don't have to pay any extra to do that. Uh, we also have an ethics officer and membership services officers who can help with any queries you might have or support you might need. But actually doesn't just apply for qualified practitioners. Um, students can use those services as well. Uh, same goes for book discounts, insurance discounts. We do have some discounts that, are, that only apply to registrants. So that's uh, counselling directories. So... Um, we do have some discounts there. And um, we've also got some really great guidance documents that I think would be of massive help to qualified practitioners. So we have a section for children and young people, and we're about to publish our framework for that this week. But we also have some good practice guidance there. Uh, supervision, gender and sexual relationship diversity. Our, um, our GSRD ambassador is Dominic Davis of Pink Therapy, who's one of the leading sources for practice and working in GSRD, uh, which is really, really fantastic for us. So um, obviously check them out if you haven't heard of them and it's something that you're interested in. Uh, we also have some really fab guidance that we've recently published for getting set up in private practice. So it gives a handy checklist of things to think about and it gives, um, it gives prompts. So things to think about 
for the, the what and the why of private practice and what works best for you and your clients rather than just saying do this 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 and this obviously there is a have you checked you've got that tick have you checked you've got that tick but also why are you doing this what what are you hoping to achieve out of this particular thing it's really comprehensive and um yeah a lot of people have given us some really good feedback on that it sounds like you're a very busy organization i know you just recently had a newsletter that went out to members and in a in a very easy to use format um i think i think counseling tutor may pinch that idea to be honest it's it's a, it was a really easy to use format now uh, as part of the interview we we asked our, our membership on our facebook page um for questions and they submitted them and um we got an awful lot of questions around scope ed which is the scope of practice and education and i think mm-hmm. anybody who's listening to this will know what scoped is what's yeah. what's the what's the ncs's view on scoped mm. that is a, a a good and timely question i think so uh i get a little bit of history the ncs as an organization uh, wasn't involved with the setting up of scoped scoped scope ed um, we've raised some really fundamental questions about the project since the first iteration back in 2018 and then to the second iteration when we published an open letter in August this year. They're all on our website under the important news section so anyone can read them. Um, the first issue for us was that it was attempting to set common standards for the profession without actually including the profession. So, um, and we did some research and found the hierarchical nature of the project doesn't really fit with the research that we did. So our members have a mix of competencies and abilities across all levels, um, not in line with the proposed standards. And then, you know, there are some other pretty big questions about the project. So what will tier A, B and C ultimately mean? Um, will there be an impact assessment? What are the unintended consequences for ethical practice? Why is scoped not modality neutral? So it kind of glosses over person-centered. Um, how does it account for you know, individual practitioners' lived experience? What will happen to the third sector um, you know, with TSE practitioners uh, you know, only being able to do some of the work in that sector? Um, and then kind of most importantly, I think for me, is what's the, you know, what's the end goal here? What are we trying to achieve? So we were invited during the latter part of this year to participate in those discussions along with other accredited registers um, to see if there's any way that we can shape this project and make it something that will be useful. So we're taking all of our questions, our members' questions, uh, and all the other issues that have been highlighted in the profession. So, uh, for example, uh, there's an open letter that's just been published by Janet Tolan and Andy Rogers Um, And that was sent to all of the involved bodies on behalf of the person-centred therapy community. Um, We'll be discussing that. And um, I don't know if you've seen it, Rory, I can send you the link if you don't have it. It's really, really interesting, really interesting reading. So now the current state of play is that we've been given an opportunity to um, give a voice to those who have concerns, our members, others in the profession that aren't necessarily our members, but have kind of burning questions and know where to make their voice heard. Uh, We'll be using our position to consult and collaborate with other organisations to try and make this project one that does indeed represent the profession if such a thing can happen. So time will tell on that, but sorry, that's a long and convoluted way of saying (laughs) where we stand at the moment. Well, I think it's very, very very comprehensive. Bit of a cheeky question here. Um, Has your membership gone up since Sculpad became public knowledge? Hmm. Um, our membership numbers have increased a little due to the scope, scope to scope to project. Um, sure, uh, a couple of people have come over citing that as the reason that they have, have joined us. Not as much as you might think uh, from reading social media, for example. I think uh, people like that we've been open about our stance. So, like I said, we publish everything that we're doing in open letters on our website, um, and that we're member led on this issue. So every major decision that we make, including this one, is ultimately down to what our members want. So, for example, with Scope to Scope Head, once we know what the final iteration will look like, we'll give our members the choice on whether to adopt it, adopt it or not. 
Um, we'll be publishing the arguments for and against, and we'll give everyone as much information as we possibly can. At the end of the day, our members are the ones working in the profession, and what they need and want is the only thing that we need and want. We don't exist without our members, and we exist to be a vehicle for what's right for them. That's that's the whole premise, the idea that we were founded on, as, you know, as we talked about earlier. Um, it's what I like about the society. It's what's kept me working here for coming up six years now. Uh, so I'm not about to abandon that at this pivotal time. Um, but yeah, so not as many new members as you might think, but definitely some. Yeah. And, and, and another question that came in from, the, from our audience was, does the NCS believe that academic training should be the primary evidence of councillor competence? I think that probably links into the the Sculped, um the last Sculped question. Oh, I see. Uh, yes, yeah, so I was, I was uh, academic. Is that academic versus vocational training? I yes. guess. Yes. Yeah. Um, so when we when we look at training and training standards. The primary thing that we look at first and foremost is does it have a placement so it has to be at least 100 100 supervised hours um and the vocational element of that training is paramount for us um the academic side is important too for sure but that you know that theoretical knowledge underpinning the therapeutic relationship is incredibly valuable and there's no disputing that but uh, we wouldn't allow someone to join our register that had just completed a degree or you know or a master's or even a doctorate if it didn't have an integral placement and you know when we audit our members we look at the ongoing cpd that they do and how they use supervision so we're not looking at academic training here either this is all about ways of enhancing practice holistically so through the things that speak to counselors themselves and their clients i can't i really can't stress enough the importance of properly using cpd and supervision for that um so I think for us, that's the, that's the heart of counselling training and, and that vocational practical element is what makes you a, a great counsellor. Um, and then, you know, continuing to learn, like it's a, it's a lifelong learning experience, yes. making sure you make the most of those, those things. So what I'm hearing is it's, it's, it's a, a, a mix of academic achievement plus you know, craft-based activity, including mm-hmm. the use of supervision, being reflective and being reflexive, and yes. and also a commitment to to lifelong learning. Yeah, absolutely, and that's what you know. That's what members sign up for when they join us. So, um, yeah, make the most of that. That's the important part of the journey for us. Ab- absolutely, and that's what makes a competent you know, compassionate practitioner, um, yeah. uh, you know, a commitment to to the work in service of the, the client, you know. Um, one of the other questions we got through was, does the NCS offer concessions for those on low income, such as carers allowance? Yes, yes. So it's basically 50% of the annual fee. So to, to get that, all someone would need to do is send along proof of their benefits, like... Um, like a letter or a bank statement showing the benefit being paid in or a screenshot from the, uh, the portal and then send that to the membership team when you apply and then they can sort that out on a direct debit for you. So we're actually right in the middle coming to the end of reviewing our fees at the moment and they'll be changing imminently. So I'm hesitant to give an actual value, but ultimately, yeah, so it's, it's 50% off well, for those in receipt of benefits. I think that answers answers that question. Fifty fifty percent off is the is the headline there, and, and yeah. finally, um, an area that's sometimes um, missed, I think, is um, our student colleagues. And mm-hmm. you know, I I think it's fair to say that when people join ethical bodies, they usually join them as students, and they usually stick with them. The ethical bodies are a bit like banks in that respect. People kind of join them when they when they're very young and then kind of stick with them. So how does the NCS support students? Yeah, um, lots of different ways. Um, So we have the ethics officer and the membership services officers that we talked about before, which means that alongside uh, supervision and tutors, we can offer support for any ethical queries that students might have. So we form part of that triangle of support. 
Um, we have a, a list of counsellors on our register that offer reduced fees uh, for students in training, be that for their own personal counselling or supervision for their placements. So I feel like that's a really tangible benefit um, that people can, that our student members can make the most of. We have um, discounts for books and insurance. So students, if you're on placement, you'll likely need insurance and you may well need to buy some books for your course. So um, we have uh, some various different publishing houses that have given us discounts to buy, uh, for our members to buy books through them and they are for students as well. We've got good practice guides on a variety of subjects. Um, so you can have a look at those as well. A free monthly magazine that keeps everyone up to date with what's going on in the profession. Discounted, oh, discounted membership fees for students. Um, and we're also looking at discounted CPD fees, but that hasn't been finalised yet. The discounted membership fees for students is in part of our fee review. So I can't tell you what those are either yet, um, but that will be coming out shortly. Um, uh, we've also got ethical guidance through the members area of the website. Um, yeah, loads of different different things, but basically lots of support uh, and discounts for students. And we're always looking for more ways that we can help. So if there's ever anything anyone wants us to help with, then I'm always happy to look at it and try and make it work if we can. Yeah, so if you are a student who is just about to think about going into practice, maybe you've secured a placement, it may be worth, you know, if you're if you're if you're you know instructed by your you know your educational establishment, your tutor to join that little body, it may be worth having a look at the NCS and having a look and going onto the website because you do offer, you know, quite a considerable uh, package for students. You know, mm -hmm. and as we've said earlier on in 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 the interview, um, you know, the NCS is recognised by the Professional Standards Authority, so. Um, I hate to use the word it's a it's a proper ethical body, but I think I think it I think it, it is it's a it is a it is an eth, it is an ethical body that's recognised in the profession. Would you say that was a fair summary? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and if you've got any questions after listening to this, then just give us a call, and we're always more than happy to answer any questions you've got. But yeah, that that was a good summary, Rory. Thank you. <laughs> Well, it's been it's been lovely talking to you, Meg. Um, uh, I, I think I think that it's really important that certainly for, for students to understand the entire world of counselling and psychotherapy, including the many ethical bodies that exist in the service of giving choice, um, not only for the student but all, students or qualified colleagues, but also in terms of the best way they can serve their clients. So, Meg Dunn. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rory. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure. Well, a big thank you to Meg Nunn from the National Counselling Society and to you, Rory, for taking your time to, to ask the questions that our audience have been asking. And I think that I, I certainly uh, was uh, surprised by some of the answers. Yeah, ab absolutely. And a big thank you to the audience who, who, who sent us those questions in. Quite a lot of questions came through. And uh, yes, and I think the one thing that I will take away from the interview is, is, is that the National Counselling Society is on the accredited register. It is um, kind of seen by employers as, as a as a ethical body that, um, that upholds standards in the profession. And I have to say they're, they're a jolly nice bunch. When you, when you speak with them, they're a, they're a jolly nice bunch of people. And, um, and, and very, very transparent. So we thank Meg for her time and uh, we hope you enjoy um, the answers that she gave. Thank you for listening to the Counselling Tutor Podcast. Find the show notes for this episode on our website at www.counsellingtutor.com.